I emphatically deny any involvement in my wife's murder. I became very depressed. I started to think of the lifestyle that I was losing, not only my wife, but my, my whole lifestyle. The person you just saw was Fred Tokers, an unthinkable crime that made national headlines shattered an idyllic family as November 29, 1994 became a date etched in American crime history, turning the Tokers family's dream into an inescapable nightmare. In the quiet, affluent Atlanta suburb of Vinings, the Tokers family, charismatic attorney Fred, devoted wife Sarah, and their children appeared an idyllic picture of success, contentment, and luxurious family life. In her car that night, Sarah Tokars died of a shotgun blast to the head. On Thanksgiving night, 1994, a horrific act of brutality revealed the darkest secrets of a Vining's home, appearing initially as a violent robbery, but actually the tip of an evil iceberg of deception, greed, and cold-blooded murder. A story of betrayal, corporate corruption and homicide intentions surfaced involving attorney Fred Tokers, who was intended to prosecute criminals. Fred and Sarah Tokers appeared to be a picture-perfect couple living a luxurious lifestyle in Atlanta's luxurious Vinings neighborhood. But their fairy tale marriage had humble beginnings. Sarah Lambrusco grew up in a working-class family in New Jersey. As a young woman in the 1980s, she made her way to the glitzy nightlife scene of New York City, working as a promoter for trendy clubs and bars. Sarah initially met Fred Tokers, a dynamic young attorney eager to make his mark in New York City in this fast-paced environment. Despite coming from opposite backgrounds, the couple hit it off. Sarah was captivated by Fred's confidence and ambition, while he was enamored with her outgoing nature. In 1985, at the age of 32, Fred and Sarah made their union official, tying the knot in a ceremony that marked the start of what seemed like a storybook marriage. The newlyweds quickly set their sights on Atlanta, Georgia, drawn by the city's brisk potential. Fred started his own law firm, while Sarah retired from nightlife and became a dedicated wife and homemaker. They settled in the upscale Vinings neighborhood, projecting the image of an affluent power couple who had achieved the American dream through hard work and determination. Little did their friends and neighbors know, the facade of marital bliss concealed ominous secrets that would eventually lead to unimaginable tragedy. Within two years, they had two sons, and they moved to a house in Marianta, which was a suburb of Atlanta. The boys' names were Ricky and Mikey. Sarah quit her job when they moved. The thing that was the most important to her was to be a mom and to be a really good mom, and she succeeded 100% with that. Fred, a former prosecutor, had transitioned into private practice and built a successful law firm. His legal prowess had garnered him respect and admiration. Sarah's unwavering dedication to their two young sons endeared her to all who knew her. They both were pillars of their community, exuding charm and elegance as they navigated the corridors of Atlanta's legal and social elite. Fred Tokers presented himself as a charming and affable attorney, well regarded within legal circles and esteemed by peers and clients alike. However, beneath this facade lay a darker reality. On the night of November 28, 1992, Sarah returned home with her children after a Thanksgiving weekend getaway. Fred left the family gathering one day earlier to meet a client in Montgomery, Alabama. John Ambrisco told his son-in-law that Sarah was just leaving. The date was November 29, 1992, just before 10 p.m., when Sarah pulled the car into the garage in the suburban community of Mariana, Georgia. Sarah Tokars and her sons Ricky, then seven, and Mikey, then four, were with her in the vehicle. Little did Sarah know, the shadows of her driveway held a grim specter of her impending doom. As she was ushered inside her own vehicle, a horrifying scene played out. As the street grew quiet, Mike, one of the kids, dozed off in the back seat. As Sarah started unloading the car, she was startled by a male intruder. He's wearing a black watch cap, dressed in dark clothing, and uh, he forces uh, Sarah and Rick back out to the vehicle. Ricky was sitting with Sarah in the front seat. The man was armed with a loaded firearm. He ordered Sarah to get inside the car and start driving. I sort of see if my mom was like still uh, awake or if she was dead, and then uh, I woke my brother up, and... You woke your brother up? Yeah, and then, uh, I told him we had to go get help, and then he went to go get help. You know, like, how you, like, the first time you hit a home run? Mm -hmm. Like, 
that? Uh, you like always remember that, don't you? Yeah, it sticks out in your memory, doesn't it? Yeah, and that's like what it was. Later, Ricky Six reported to the police that Sarah was forced to make a right turn while driving by the armed intruder. Pushing her car over, Sarah objected, saying that the street was dead end. The intruder jumped out of the vehicle and ran away. The boys inside the car coasted into an open field before rolling to a stop. Ricky reached over the body of his mother to switch off the ignition. Sarah had always told him not to leave the vehicles running, was it safe? So he takes the keys from the truck and they see some lights from a house. It was quite a walk for them, but they managed and they went to this house and knocked on the door and said that his mother had been hurt very badly. The residents called the police. The first detective to arrive at the scene saw Sarah hunched over in the front seat. His name was Pat Banks. One thing I always remember was she had long hair and the blood would just run down and just the droplets would drop off of. A different officer led Banks to an ambulance so the kids could get shock treatment there. The children hadn't been physically hurt, but the first thing I noticed when the ambulance doors opened up was the smell of vomit. Michael's shirt was off, and he had gotten sick. They both spattered with their mother's blood. The morning of November 29, 1992, shattered the tranquility of the Tokar household, plunging their world into chaos and despair. Sarah Toker was found dead in their suburban home, the victim of a brutal and senseless murder. She was shot twice in the head, but the most heartbreaking details of all, her two young sons witnessed this atrocity. Their innocent eyes were forced to behold a horror no child should ever witness. The incident was reported to Fred Tokers right away. Fred negotiated for the kids to stay with his brother. The police contacted and informed Sarah's whole family about the incident. In Cobb County, Georgia, investigators searched the Toker's house. Someone broke into the house, but the authorities soon became suspicious. My first impression was that the scene was staged to make it look like a burglary. It was not a burglary. Although nothing significant or valuable was taken from the house, investigators discovered that the alarm system had been turned off. The sliding glass door, which had a broken lock, was the entry point for the intruder. As the investigators delved deeper into the circumstances surrounding Sarah's death, a complex web of deceit, betrayal, and criminality began to emerge. Sarah's family was gathered in a hotel in Atlanta to be questioned about what they knew. Sarah's father also agreed with the officers. Although Sarah's husband didn't seem as anxious to participate as the others, they were confronted with a perplexing puzzle of conflicting narratives and hidden motives. Fred Tokers, who has yet to grant the police a formal interview, strolled with his mother on the day of Sarah Tokers' funeral. This time, Sarah's family had serious doubts about Fred's behavior. I'd never seen anybody act like him before. He was just more anxious than sad. He never talked about Sarah. He never said, oh my God, poor Sarah. Oh, what she went through, poor Rick and Mike. He was just all acting like, I'm scared. I gotta get out of Dodge, he kept saying. He said, Gretchen, I hope you understand the reason I can't go to the police about anything is because I've taken a lot of money from some shady clients and not paid taxes on them. And I'm afraid if they look into my business dealings, they'll accuse me of tax evasion. The death of Sarah Tokars prompted a thorough and in-depth investigation. The layers of deceit that had veiled the Tokars family in secrecy were gradually lifted by the murder investigation of Sarah Tokars. To find the cause of the tragedy, law enforcement officers investigated leads, interviewed suspects, and went through evidence. Soon, Fred Tokars was charged with offenses beyond tax evasion. Now, he thought he was that smart, smarter than the cops. He was wrong. The Atlanta news media latched onto the story, comparing it to a popular movie. One of the stories early on was that it was kind of a Cape Fear type of situation, that here was a lawyer who had a client that somehow had it out for him. And so uh, one of the lawyers was telling us that the, the, he knew of several lawyers buying guns. We wanted to know about anyone that he might have been associated with who may have had some ill will toward him or his wife. The focus of our investigation originally was that maybe they were after him and not Mrs. Tokars. Fred consented to speak with the police during an interview after that week. Ron Hunton, a detective, led the questioning. Tokars, do you have any idea who may have wanted to kill Sarah? Just can you imagine it? He was pretty nervous. He talked a lot. Uh, but at the same time, he didn't give us a whole lot of information. 
He couldn't remember details. Fred did reveal that he and his wife had some life insurance that would give him $1.75 million when Sarah passed away. What kind of insurance policies did you have on Sarah then? Sarah and I have the same type of insurance policies. One of them is for um, $250,000. One of them is for a million. And I think that there's another one for, uh, for a half a million. Every marriage has its ups and downs, but I, I would be shocked if I thought that she was considering a divorce right now from me. Did she sleep with you? Yes. The police received some contradictory information. They spoke to Sarah's children. We had spoken to Rick and Mike, Sarah's uh, small children, and they had told us that she did not sleep with Fred. The marriage between Fred and Sarah Tokars was not in good shape and hadn't been for quite some time. Sarah didn't like the sort of people he was dealing with, uh, the hours he was keeping. More they learned about Fred, he became a prime suspect. She'd call me up and say, Karen, I don't know what to do. He's just always yelling at me all the time and always mad. And she tried so hard in the beginning to try to make everything be even and at peace for the boys so that they didn't have to grow up in a house of all fighting and yelling and things like that. Sarah informed her sister that Fred kept her on a strict allowance and was rarely home. He also didn't spend his time with the kids. She suspected that he was having an affair. Sarah considered getting a divorce, but she was afraid she would lose her boys' custody. So she dropped the idea. She was considering getting a divorce once more in 1992. Following her attorney's advice, she hired a detective to find out if her husband was having an affair. I was on a stakeout and did uncover him having an affair. Uh, and we identified the party. When Sarah revealed the information to Fred, he wrote off the affair as a pointless fling. Sarah didn't believe it, and she stopped trusting her husband. She told me that she was afraid of Fred, that he had threatened that if she got a divorce, that he had enough contacts that she would never take the children away. Sarah decided to get herself a bargaining chip against her husband. She began copying the financial records from the basement locker without Fred's knowledge. Sarah brought those copies to the residence of her sister, Chrissy. We sat on the floor and we looked at them, and they looked very suspicious to us. There were accounts with it looked like hundreds of thousands of dollars in them with what looked like phony names on the accounts. Unfamiliar to many, Fred was deeply involved in illicit activities, including drug trafficking and money laundering, which would eventually contribute to the unraveling of his carefully constructed image. Just before the Thanksgiving ceremony in 1992, Sarah called her sister Carolyn. She informed her that she had found a way to divorce her husband and get custody of the children. She's like, Karen, I've got all this new stuff on Fred. And she was relieved that this was finally her way out. And I said, what, Sarah, what? Tell me what it was. And she said, no, I can't. I'll tell you when I see you. What did Sarah know that cost her life? She made me promise that if anything ever happened to her, I would take any information that I had to the police. The detective did go to the police and inform them all of what he knew. Number one, Sarah posed a real danger to him of exposing his criminal activity. And secondly, there was the motivation of insurance policies. The investigators were sure of one thing that Fred didn't trigger it with his own hands. He hired someone else to do it. The Ambrisco family consented to talk to reporters in order to solicit public assistance. This is something for us to do to try to help and make sure that someone else's sister or loved one can't get hurt like this. And that's what we're gonna do. We'll just won't rest until we can get some justice. Within a month, they solved one mystery, the identity of the intruder who pulled the trigger. There was a anonymous telephone call followed up by other telephone calls from related people in the Atlanta area who told us that we ought to be looking at a person by the name of Curtis Rower. Curtis was a 22 years old drug addict and also a small time dealer. He had bragged about the murder to some of his friends who called the police. When Curtis was caught, he confessed that he was hired to end Sarah's life for $5,000 by a 28 years old businessman named Eddie Lawrence, who had some previous criminal records. Eddie Lawrence is nothing more than a street mutt in a suit. That's all he is, um, con man. Um, it's just a low life mutt. It led to the conclusion 
that Eddie had a quiet history with Fred Tokers. Eddie Lawrence hired Fred as his lawyer in January 1992, prior to the homicide, over accusations of counterfeiting. After that, Fred started investing in Eddie Lawrence Industries, which included a construction company. He told us a lot, two, over two hours probably we talked to him, he told us a lot, but he never once mentioned Eddie Lawrence. Fred returned for another round of interviews to ask questions about his business associates. I throw a picture down, a bookend photo of Lawrence down on the table in front of tow cars. You know that man? It's Eddie Lawrence. This man was never mentioned. Well, I'm not sure if I understand what you're talking about. You never told me anything about Eddie Lawrence. Well, you never asked me anything about him. So, obviously by this time, we're really looking at Fred hard. And uh, it's starting to add up on him. It really is. And we're really on to him then. Central to investigate the revelation of Fred's clandestine dealings in the shadowy world of drug trafficking and his illicit affair with a mysterious stripper named Kim Brown. The truth behind Sarah's tragic demise began to emerge with startling clarity. These revelations cast doubt on Fred's assertions of innocence and raise questions about his potential involvement in ending Sarah's life. The overwhelming publicity was so heavy against him. I've been a criminal defense lawyer for over 20 years, and I have covered everything in this, in this state. I have never seen anything like the publicity in this. Additionally, the discovery of financial discrepancies and inconsistencies in Fred's personal and professional affairs further deepened suspicion surrounding his role in the crime. The question began to arise. Was Fred Tokers truly the victim, or was there more to the story? Fred was taken into custody and he was brought to trial with the man he hired to pull the trigger. Fred's sons were in Florida, preparing for Christmas with the family. Fred insisted on coming with us, unfortunately. And Fred kept telling us, quit talking to the press, quit talking to the police, just let this all die down. And I kept saying, Fred, why? And he said, well, the police are just stupid. The courtroom became a theater of the absurd as prosecutors meticulously laid bare the sordid details of Fred's double life, painting a damning portrait of a man consumed by greed and ambition. The trial of Fred Takars captivated the attention of the Atlanta community and garnered widespread media coverage. Prosecutors meticulously presented their case, meticulously outlining Fred's motive, means, and opportunity to orchestrate his wife's homicide. Fred had checked into a hotel in Florida the day before Christmas evening and overindulged in sleeping medications. He wrote a suicide note. He proclaimed in the suicide note to prove his innocence, I love Sarah. I never hurt her, and I have now died for her. When he didn't pick up the phone, a family member became concerned and informed hotel security. They hurried Fred to the hospital. Fred's suicide attempt showed two things. One, that he was involved and that he was guilty, and he knew that they were closing in on him. And two, that we had to just be so careful with the boys because we felt that he, the boys were not safe with Fred. The connection was unclear. However, they cast a long, dark shadow over him. The investigators were faced with a daunting task to unravel the truth from the tangled web of lies and deceit. Could this man who stood the pillar of society be capable of orchestrating such a horrifying act? In December 1992, Fred called a press conference. I emphatically deny any involvement in my wife's murder, and any suggestion that I might have been involved in any way deeply hurts me. Unfortunately, after drinking too much, and after taking some back pain medication, I became very depressed. I started to think of the lifestyle that I was losing, not only my wife, but my, my whole lifestyle. When Fred said his lifestyle, it was just another one of those things that we all just thought was just so strange. And it seemed so selfish that how could he be thinking about his lifestyle when his wife was brutally murdered in front of his two little boys. With the weight of the evidence stacked against him, Fred Tokar stood trial for his role in orchestrating his wife's homicide. But they didn't arrest him that soon because they needed more evidence for that. We had to tie in Eddie Lawrence with tow cars. And only until finally Eddie Lawrence turned state's evidence 
And at that point in time, we had the smoking gun. In August 1993, Eddie Lawrence was taken into court to enter a plea and be charged with Sarah Toker's murder. How do you plead to the charge in count one? Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Are you in fact guilty of that? Eddie was given a life term in jail instead of the death penalty for his plea. He consented to provide two testimonies against Fred in the federal trial. On August 25th, 1993, Fred was arrested. Fred's trail came first. The trail proceedings were a grueling process, with every moment filled with anticipation as the courtroom watched Fred at the center of this horrific saga with bated breath. The prosecution presented a mountain of evidence against Fred, meticulously laying out their case. They portrayed a picture of a man consumed by avarice and a desire for power, prepared to do whatever it takes to preserve his way of life and reputation, including planning his own wife's homicide. Eddie Lawrence, a career criminal who claimed that Fred Tokers hired him to commit the murder, provided crucial testimony for the prosecution's case. Lawrence provided detailed accounts of his interactions with Tokers and the events leading up to Sarah's death, painting a damning portrait of Fred's involvement in the crime. Forensic evidence, including ballistics analysis and DNA testing, further corroborated Lawrence's testimony and provided additional incriminating evidence against Fred Tokers. One such testimony that sent chills down the spine of the courtroom was that of the hitman, Curtis Rower. His narration of the event was cold and emotionless as he divulged the gruesome details of the crime he was hired to commit. Rower explained how Fred approached him, how he promised him a sizable sum in exchange for committing an unthinkable crime, and how he carried out the horrifying act that fateful night. Rower's testimony was damning, but it was not the only evidence against Fred. The prosecution presented phone records, bank statements, and other pieces of evidence that made everything clear. Fred had not only planned his wife's murder, but also taken steps to cover his track. Despite Fred's attempts to maintain his innocence and discredit Lawrence's testimony, the weight of the evidence against him proved insurmountable. As the evidence mounted, the courtroom's atmosphere grew heavy. The audacity of the crime, the calculated planning, and the cold-blooded execution all pointed to a man who had lost all sense of humanity. The prosecution did not hold back, presented every detail, every testimony, and every damning fact with unflinching determination. The trial proceedings were a testament to the pursuit of justice, a reminder that no one, regardless of their status or power, could escape the law's long arm. In the end, justice had its say. In November 1994, Fred Tokars was found guilty of conspiracy to commit homicide and other charges related to his wife's death. I think that the evidence withstood the intense scrutiny by the jury, which it did. Norma was visibly shaken, but it was just the beginning. Her son still has to face the murder charge in a Georgia courtroom. Mrs. Tokars, <laughs> is your son guilty of murder? No, no, no! Sarah's family also soaked up the media with the joy of justice. I can't look at Fred. All I thought to myself the whole time they were reading, guilty, 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 was after Sarah was murdered, we all, we all felt so bad that we weren't there to help her or protect her. The man at the center of the controversy, Fred Tokers, was given four life sentences without the chance of release. A life for life, some might say. The scales of justice, heavy with evidence and testimonies, had tipped against him. But that wasn't the end of his legal woes. The law had more in store for him. In April 1994, along with his life sentence, Fred faced an additional 45 years on federal charges. Racketeering, money laundering, and a host of other charges were added to his docket. The trial was televised live on court TV. As I think most of, uh, most of the community, uh, that this was a case in which the death penalty, if there ever should be a death penalty. In 1997, four years after the incident, the jury found Fred Tokars guilty of her murder. Four days later, the same jury found that the state had proved beyond a reasonable doubt several aggravating circumstances permitting a death sentence, but nonetheless exercised its discretion to impose a life sentence on Tokars. We're not gonna have any outburst whatsoever in the courtroom, it's just not proper. Bring in the jury, please. <clears throat> Has the jury reached a unanimous verdict in all the issues that were presented to you? Yes, Your Honor, we have. We, the jury, find beyond a reasonable doubt that the offender caused or directed another to commit murder. 
we, the jury, have found beyond a reasonable doubt that one or more of the alleged statutory aggravating circumstances do exist, and we recommend a life sentence to be imposed. He had the perfect life that most people would think, a beautiful wife and two lovely children, and a successful career. And he threw it all away because he was greedy. The Hollywood director made a movie about the case, and they cast the detectives for it. Have seen the two primary investigators on a murder case signing a movie deal and getting money, uh, you know, in the midst of the investigation. It's insanity. The detective regrets the decision, but they insisted that it didn't affect their investigation. Whatever they tried to say about us, about our credibility or lack thereof, they could not destroy that case. The case was put together on fact and good investigative police work. If you can't attack the evidence, attack the officer. If everything's sewn up in a neat bag, try to discredit the people who are presenting it. When the movie was released in 1994, detectives were fired by the Cobb County Police Department. Later, all of Fred's illegal history was revealed. Associated with him after hours, went to bars with him, ate with him, um, visited with him. They got to be close. Jesse Ferguson and Julius Klein were Detroit narcotics dealers who relocated to Atlanta in 1985. Klein invested $75,000 in the VIP club with Mason as the club's manager. Andre Willis, a co-owner of the nightclub Diamonds and Pearls, bought cocaine from Klein and Klein, distributing it in Chattanooga and Atlanta. Willis claimed that Klein's relationship with Mason was a front for the nightclubs as they had criminal records and couldn't obtain a liquor license. He came into contact with a number of prostitutes, dancers that were very colorful in and of themselves and had some very good evidence to give against Fred Tokars. In 1986, Marvin Baynard defended narcotics dealer Dexter Askew in court, claiming Tokars earned $5,000 to $10,000 a week selling cocaine. Baynard requested a $10,000 retainer and promised to help him legitimize himself by incorporating Baynard's company. Baynard and his partner, Alex Yancey, used Tokars' company from 1986 to 1989, buying cocaine from Klein and Greg Johnson. Murray Silver collaborated with Associate District Attorney Tokers from 1986 to 1989 who wrote a brochure on cocaine laundering, allegedly using false information about the IRS. Silver recommended Tokars' method and he taught money laundering lectures to law enforcement. Mason Klein and Ferguson accused Michael Jones of stealing money from Mason's house in 1988, with Jones testifying to violent confrontations. Ferguson claimed they kept large amounts of money for drugs. Mason admitted to believing Jones had embezzled funds and ordered him to be brought inside. Mason, Klein, Colleen, Fraser, and Kohler founded Zebra and Zebra Management Inc., but were kicked out due to Klein's drug dealer reputation. Mark McDougall and Zane Carroll, both cocaine users, invested in the Parrot nightclub with Tokars, forming Parrot Acquisition Corporation. Klein, Mason's silent partner, was a financial backer. McDougall threatened him with a rifle after his dissatisfaction with the investment. Mason, under contract to support Dayon Sanders, was introduced to Douglas McKendrick by Willie Harris and signed a contract. They were listed as directors in Tokars's 1990 Atlanta Entertainment Management Inc. But Mason was informed of Klein's cocaine dealings. In 1988, Harris began distributing cocaine for James Mason, receiving between $250,000 and $500,000. In 1991, Mason helped to keep him in custody. Tokar's affidavits showed Harris was unaware of Mason's or Klein's illegal activities. After receiving bond, Tokar's threatened to convict Harris and give him a long prison term unless he set someone up, which Harris declined. Tokar's argued he could not set up Klein. Mason obtained $50,000 from Brown to open a club, while John Vera paid Mason $25,000 for leasehold rights to Diamonds and Pearls. Lawrence was a black man in the most conservative county in this state and was facing the murder of a, of a white woman. You know, he was going to the chair. So he had to come up with a story. In November 1991, Mason presented Vara to Brown, who was under control. In 1992, Mason was introduced to Eddie Lawrence at Diamonds and Pearls, where Lawrence was revealed to be involved in drug money laundering, and the establishment was renovated for $500,000. Lawrence knew that Fred was going to cut him off from funds and 
Lawrence may have been just trying to, to retaliate against Fred and put Fred's life in such a chaos that he wouldn't cut off Lawrence. In 1992, Brown supplied cocaine to Klein. Klein was upset with Mason for losing a parrot. Canis contributed $150,000 and Klein sought financial advice. In 1992, a car carrying 115 kilograms of cocaine was stopped in Amarillo, Texas. Brown, the driver, was apprehended and found with digital beepers. $49,700 in cash, diamonds and pearls reports, and a Peachtree Entertainment affiliation. Tow cars represented Brown during a hearing regarding his detention. Most of the people that Eddie was involved with he had flim flammed, taken them from, for money. If you don't believe Eddie Lawrence, then you can't convict Fred. Mason claimed Brown was the club's doorman and sole proprietor of Diamonds and Pearls, leading to a subpoena for club record submission. Twilight sued Mason, Klein, and Atlanta House Clubs for failing to pay $50,000 for Zazu's acquisition, claiming Atlanta House Clubs was non-existent and seeking $50,000 after noticing a liquor license advertisement. Tokars revealed Atlanta House Club's assets, including Klein's Phoenix Club, and suggested Twilight's help them obtain a judgment against them in exchange for dismissing Mason. He claimed drugs contributed to Klein's homicide. The once successful lawyer was now a prisoner, ensnared by the very system he once navigated with ease. Following Fred Tokars' conviction, the Atlanta community was met with a pall of sorrow as the memory of Sarah's untimely death lingered in the minds and hearts of everyone who had been touched by her kindness and warmth. And he turned around and whispered, I'm okay, I love you, uh, to his mom before being escorted out. I'm so happy and so thankful, I'm so glad. Life is sweet. Fred knew that Sarah and Rick and Mike were gonna walk into that house that night. He knew that Rick and Mike were gonna be there. And we can't understand how anyone can plan the murder of a young mother like that and be spared. Who was there to spare Sarah? No one was there to show Sarah any mercy. The conviction of Fred Tokars brought some measure of closure to Sarah Tokars' family and friends, but the aftermath of the homicide continued to reverberate throughout the community. The case served as a sobering reminder of the fragility of trust and the depths of depravity to which some individuals are willing to sink in pursuit of their own selfish desires. It also highlighted the resilience of those left behind in the wake of tragedy as Sarah Tokers' family and friends rallied together to support her two young sons in the aftermath of their mother's senseless murder. Legal disputes arose in the years after Fred Tokars' conviction regarding the custody of the Tokars' children, who were left orphaned by the death of their mother and the imprisonment of their father. Two young lives, Ricky and Mike, were left adrift in the aftermath of their mother's murder and their father's incarceration. This case had a profound impact on the children. Despite the challenges they faced, Sarah Tokar's family gave the boys a caring and supportive atmosphere, making sure they got the attention and assistance they needed to cope with the loss of their parents. The case of the Tokar's family remains etched in the annals of Atlanta's criminal history as a cautionary tale of deception, betrayal, and the pursuit of justice. Well, after 30-something years in the medical field trying to save life and preserve it, it would be hard for me to say, okay. I was thinking that the boys had lost their mother, and if they lost their father too, it would uh, be more devastating than ever. I wanted to apologize to them. I wanted to tell them that I was sorry. Um, Karen Wilcox looked, right, looked, looked me right in the face and... and and asked me, you know, I, she was mouthing and she said, how could you do this? To me, that was completely an injustice, an injustice done to Sarah. And that the rest of those jurors went along with that, they let her down, they let us down. While Fred Tokers may have thought he could escape the consequences of his actions, his conviction stands as a testament to the unwavering dedication of law enforcement officials and the resilience of those who seek truth and justice in the face of adversity. The case of the Tokars family remains etched in the annals of Atlanta's criminal history as a cautionary tale of deception, betrayal, and the pursuit of justice. What about Sarah? And all she cares about is the protection of her children, only to have her brains blown out over those two little boys because of the mastermind over here, because of the greed, 
the unparalleled ambition and because she just simply was in the way. Fred Tokar's conviction serves as a testament to the unwavering pursuit of truth and justice by dedicated law enforcement, even in the face of unimaginable adversity. She thought that he was a father, he's an animal. Anyone who could plan a murder and kill the mother in front of the two little boys is not a father. The legacy of Sarah Tokar's endures as a reminder of the enduring power of love, courage, and perseverance in the face of darkness as the shadows cast by deceit and greed are illuminated by the light of truth. I thought if I could just live a few more years to give them a safe, secure area where they could grow up, and then Joni and Chrissy came to help us, and they worked like dogs trying to work with the boys. When their grandparents passed away, the boys' aunt Joni became their guardian. All have tried to give them some semblance of a normal childhood. Two brothers, shown here with their little league team, have undergone extensive counseling. They still struggle with the awful memory of their mother's execution. What every child fears is a boogeyman, and that became reality to them. And for their whole life, they will have to live with that terror. Psychologists always talk about closure, but for our family, there is no closure. Because we have the life sentence now of living with this horrific grief.